So when a doomsday book uh, refers to a place uh, through a place name, it then indicates how many caricates or plowlands belong to that place. And so it's recording actually not, not a settlement site in terms of a habitation, uh, or not that itself, but it, it's more interested in the farming resources attributed to that settlement. Uh, and those are within the township. Uh, in uh, Anglo-Saxon law codes um, in, the, in the 10th century, it, it's clear that townships, which were called toons, but I, I think we call them townships now to avoid the word town, which obviously means to us something very different. But the, t the, the, the tombs recorded in the law codes uh, are communities and the lands that the communities farm. And they are the, effectively the lowest level of local government. Above them are the uh, the more regional units called the wapentakes or the or the hundreds uh, and above those of course the the, the shires and so on but um I, I don't know if that explains sufficiently what they are oh i think so yes thank you yeah. right okay the next question butterwick is that an anglo-saxon name origin yes it is yes yes there's quite a few like these like yes, the, is that, uh, okay. Right, I'll go through all the all the questions about places. Crake, what was that? The origin of that name? Uh, please bear in mind, I, I'm not a place name expert. I'm <laughs> simply using place names. Uh, my thing is settlements, but um, Crake is a, a British name, so it's pre-Anglo-Saxon. It is thought uh, referring to the crag on which the settlement sits, on which the village sits. Right. And one more, Yearsley, or Yearsley, I'm not sure how you say it. Uh, no, I, well, the uh, the Lear ending refers, it is thought, to clearing in woodland, if, if that's the derivation. I mean, the problem is that uh, a place name in the form it is today doesn't necessarily give you an accurate indication of what the original name was if it was Old English or Old Norse. Uh, you have to look at its form in the earliest records, Doomsday uh, and, and later medieval records, uh, and that's what place names people do. So I, I'm a bit hesitant to, uh, to put hand on heart and say exactly what it means. There's, there's another question very much on those lines. Yeah. Are there any villages or towns that have kept their original name? I live in Darlington and it's gone through several name changes, I think at least five. Yes, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I suspect, was I, th I think in the 12th century, Darlington was Durnington, maybe, something like that. But I, I, I mean, what, I, what I've been focusing on really, are the, the, the second parts of the names, the endings. The, so in Darlington, it would be the Ingertum. Uh, ending of the name. Again, it's another tune of a specific sort. Uh, names change and sometimes they don't now look very much like they looked uh, at the time of Doomsday Book when most of them were first uh, recorded or, or the earliest records that we have. Um, but uh, onomasts, uh, those who specialize in place names, can uh, follow the uh, derivation of the modern name back to, to, to what it might have been in, in, in those times. But that's not something that, uh, that I can do. <laughs> but there's a, a question about if thorps are created by splitting by names, why are they thorps and not more bees? Um, a good question, but not, uh, I, I, it may indicate, it may be a a kind of a functional uh, uh, derivation, so that so that Thorpe was the kind of name you used for a dependent settlement, for a dependent township. Um, so uh, I, th I, th I think what they're doing is is, is they're creating a unit which um, which has a specific 
from oh, it's a specific type of unit that therefore has that specific type of name. Right. Uh, somebody's asking, have you published the work that you've presented today? <laughs> so the I, I've I've written three articles, which are all going to be published in the journal called Medieval Settlement Research. Uh, the first one was published last December, uh, and the second one is, I th is is just through the refereeing process, and that therefore will be published uh, in December 2021. And the third one, probably in the following issue in December 2022. Right. I hope. Yeah. Uh, several people have helpfully suggested that that crake refers to corn crakes, so that might explain that one. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> why, um, uh, yeah. Okay. Why did we believe there was so little settlement by Scandinavians north of the Tees? Um. That, that's a question that could take a long time to answer, but uh, it, I mean, it could be because, because the, uh, the centre of the uh, Hiberna Norse Kingdom of York, uh, of York was York itself, and therefore you'd expect a, a concentration around York, but I, I'm not actually sure that that really happens. There, there are an awful lot of new territories up uh, through Thurston, North Allerton, those sort of areas. Uh, and also between the uh, River Tees on the north side and, and the Cleveland Hills on the south side. So, uh, so, so clearly the, 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 there was plenty of settlement going on in those northern parts of North Yorkshire, but I think there are only about five or six certain examples north of the River Tees. One of, one of them, another Aislabe, is just across the River Tees uh, from Yorkshire. And I, I, I suspect, although this is something I'm only really just starting to work on, I suspect it, it concerns very much the relationship of the, the early Viking rulers with uh, the religious community known as the community of St Cuthbert who uh, started off in Lindisfarne in Northumberland or off the, off the coast of Northumberland. And in uh, about 883, uh, resettled themselves at uh, Chesterley Street in Durham. And a hundred years later, they moved to Durham itself. And they, they had, uh, according to some of the uh, written sources of the later 11th and early 12th centuries, they had a hand in uh, the uh, appointment of one of the early uh, Viking kings. So not um, within a decade of, of Halfdan's settlement, uh, there's a story that uh, they helped to uh, ensure that a man called Guthrun, who'd actually been a slave at one time, became, well, became king and he was elected king by the Scandinavians and he was acclaimed, uh, according to one source, not just by the by the Scandinavians, by the Vikings, but also by the English. And the whole ceremony seems to have been um, orchestrated by the community of St Cuthbert or their leaders. And they, they had, uh, the, 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 at the core of the community was the body of St Cuthbert who died in the seventh century, but 200 years later, his body was still reportedly incorrupt. It hadn't decayed. And they carried him around, including one visit to Craig in the just before they settled at Chesterley Street. Uh, some of the narratives talk about them fleeing the Vikings, but actually they head towards the centres of Viking power. So the relationship is is not what it appears to be from some of the written sources. And I think that they had uh, enormous influence over certainly King Guthrid, who was. Uh, king from about 883 to 895 when he died he was buried at York in the Minster and so I, I think they probably dissuaded the Vikings from settling on land north of the Tees that was regarded as the uh, heritage of the the community of St Cuthbert. 
Uh, and that's as far as that can go. <laughs> a question, if there were rival people living near each other, was it more likely they would fight each other or barter products and live peacefully? I, I, it, I, I, they wouldn't have been fighting each other, I don't think. They're, 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 there is obviously uh, warfare. I, I, I'm not saying that the Scandinavian settlement, the Viking settlement, was uh, simply a peaceful event or series of events. Uh, there clearly was uh, conflict at various times, mainly with the Anglo-Saxon authorities, although no doubt the peasantry, as in all such conflicts, will have uh, taken the brunt of the of the attack from uh, from the Vikings. The Vikings would have been marauding and uh, requisitioning uh, livestock and, and crops and so on to support themselves. But I, I, I get the feeling that when when this settlement was organized, it, it, there, there will have been issues, but uh, I, I think it wouldn't have been open warfare. It would have been conflict between natives and immigrants. Uh, as really occurs in in many contexts over many centuries, uh, there there are some signs. King Edgar, who I mentioned in relation to Newbold, he um, what one of his law codes is specifically uh, related, I think, to the uh, situation in Yorkshire and and relates a lot to to cattle theft and the discovery of stolen cattle, uh, and it it mentions that the, the, the Danes, the Vikings, can impose their own uh, uh, judgment uh, and penalties on anyone found um, guilty of, of cattle rustling. And so I think there would be lots of uh, tensions of those kinds happening in these communities, but perhaps no more than, um, you know, you'd expect with a fairly sudden settlement of quite a large immigrant community in in any in any context there's another question that follows on from that are there any sources for land disputes between viking and anglo-saxon named parties church courts which might uh, no no uh, i mean well, one of the problems is, is that we simply uh, don't have uh, those sorts of sources available so um Documents, uh, the documents which survive uh, relate to uh, the Archbishopric of York, uh, the Bishops uh, of Ripon, uh, the community of St Cuthbert, but the, there aren't many or, original, there aren't many authentic copies of original documents that survive. The, so so they, would, they wouldn't really tell us whether it was settlement or conquest, they just aren't enough. That's right. That's right. There, there, there's some evidence from archaeology. Uh, 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 Julian Richards, who I mentioned uh, in, in the talk, he has excavated a site at Cotton on the Yorkshire Wells where uh, there was clearly a conflict between Anglo-Saxons and uh, Vikings. But I, I, I think the circumstances there may have been uh, fairly particular and related to um, the uh, to, to, to the jurisdiction of the Northumbrians uh, rather than to the to the general peasant population. Right. Uh, there's a question where somebody's very interested in the origins of Pickering as an Anglo-Saxon estate. Could you say a little more about this or the sources please? Yes, I, I, I mean the trouble is there's so few historical sources uh, for this period, certainly ones that are reliable uh, and, and uh, not, you know, rather than much later in date, that, uh, I mean, it, it's great for speculation, but it's quite hard to pin anything down uh, with, with what you might call facts. But um, Pickering was, in the Middle Ages, obviously the centre of uh, royal administration, part of the Duchy of Lancaster at one stage, and there was a forest there, which uh, I think was was used by some of the some of the kings for hunting purposes. It has uh, a it has uh, some Anglo-Saxon sculpture in the church there, 
Uh, but I, the, the thing that struck me about Pickering was that it was, it was close to Lastingham. Mm -hmm. uh, Lastingham was a monastery founded in the 650s, and it was founded by one of the kings of this part of Northum Northumbria, the, the area occupied by a people called the Deirans. And the king, uh, according to Bede, founded this monastery so that Bishop said uh, one, one, of, one of the people who advised him uh, could be based there. Uh, and it was intended that the king should be able more frequently to uh, meet up with him and get advice from him. So it, it implies that there was a royal centre somewhere close to Lastingham. And of course, Pickering is not very far from Lastingham. It just, I, I won't go into all the details, but on a number of um, bases, it, it just seems very likely that this was already uh, a royal centre in the seventh century and uh, probably with hunting grounds attached as it was in, in the post-conquest, the post-Norman period. And a question about, does your rationale and your thinking about these names extend, extend to the southeast of Yorkshire? So examples of Willoughby, Ellaby, Thirtleby. Uh, right, so, so, so we're talking about what, Holderness and, and the, the East Friday. Uh, it may or may not. I mean, what, what, one of the problems of, uh, I, I think that I noticed about all the discussions and the, the arguments that have been going on about the extent of Scandinavian settlement, when it happened, how many people were involved in it, uh, they've all been based on you know one or two pieces of information from specific locations which are then applied to the whole area of, of England that we 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 call the the Dane law the area which which displays various different types of evidence for Scandinavian influence and I think part of the problem has been that if there's variation, if there's a lot of variation in terms of settlement, settlement numbers, methods of settlement, extent of warfare, all those sort of things, if, if that varies from one part of the Dane law to another, then you're going to miss all those variations and you're going to be making misapplications of some conclusions from one area, which might be valid in that area to another. And so I'm very carefully not um, extending my conclusions about Eastern Yorkshire to any other part of the Dane law or even any other part of Yorkshire. And so the work that I'm going to be doing in at the Vale of York and the Vale of uh, Mowbray are really a, a comparative study. But that doesn't mean to say that what's happening uh, in the southern end of the East Riding or in South Yorkshire, or in Lincolnshire or East Anglia is necessarily going to come up with the same answers. I, 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 th I think what I'm, what I would call for is, is more detailed uh, study of this kind rather than just applying some of the conclusions that I've come to to other places. Right, well there's one about uh, Norse settlements in the Yorkshire Dales saying that they don't often <laughs> have a or tun ending. Is that because the Vikings came via Ireland or just because more remote areas. <laughs> um, the the, the uh, place names uh, are are probably uh, probably more Norwegian place names, as it were, in the in the in the northwest and the Yorkshire Dales uh, than in the areas around York. Uh, and the, uh, traditionally it's been seen uh, as an area that was occupied by Vikings coming from Ireland and right. um, a, a, a sort of a different phase of, of, of settlement. So, I mean, I, I, I certainly wouldn't want to try to uh, sort of Im impose any, any of the suggestions that I've made about Eastern Yorkshire onto those sort of areas. Um, I, I, I just, you know, but, but I think it would be worth looking in detail to see what the evidence is there. Are there a lot of abandoned settlements? Not 
not a huge number. Um, the, I mean, one, one of the things that always strikes me is that if you look at an ordnance survey map and you pick out the names of villagers, uh, particularly in this part of Yorkshire, um, and then look at Doomsday Book, most of them are already there. You know, the, 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 names, the names are there from, uh, uh, and, and, and presumably the, settle the settlements may not have been in the same place, but there was a community with that name at Doomsday, and there's still a community with that name in the 19th and 20th centuries. So uh, there aren't many, there are some, but not many, that have communities that have been founded since the time of Doomsday in Yorkshire. And equally, there are not that many that have been lost since Doomsday, or, or certainly lost before, let's say, the 14th and 15th centuries. There are quite a few deserted medieval villages. But the just because you've got a deserted medieval village doesn't mean to say that you've lost the township. So I showed maps of Warren Percy Township because its boundaries were still known in the 19th century, but there hadn't actually been a village in that township since the 16th century. So, so, so I, I think one of the problems is that people kind of slide from talking about settlement sites to talking about townships, and the two are very different things. And if you're looking at townships themselves, these territories which belong to communities, and the communities might be in a single village, or they might live in farms scattered around the township, uh, both those patterns are known in various different parts of England, um, the, 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 the townships do tend to survive even if the village settlements don't. But having said that, quite a lot of uh, Boo settlements and also Thorpe settlements do not survive in terms of either the township or the settlement site itself. And, and it's quite interesting, the, 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 there are quite a few that I, I didn't really talk about, but Roxby is one of them. Roxby Township did not survive. It was uh, probably in the 14th century, it, it, it was incorporated into Farmerby Township. And I think this is, it's, it's about the ones that are rather smaller and less economically viable. And that applies to a number of Bew settlements, obviously not to help a bit. Uh, and it also applies to a number of Thorpes as well. And so their townships have been reincorporated back into uh, neighbouring townships before the 19th century, before the boundaries were mapped. Right. There's a, a comment that the Bew sounds like an ancient version of a word for cow. No, 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 it's, it, 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 it's, it's Old Norse, yeah. and uh, as I understand it, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't speak Old Norse or New Norse, but um, as I understand it, the, uh, the, the letter Y is, is, is a vowel and it's pronounced bu. Right. And, 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 and the problem about the by ending is if you say by names, by names actually means something else. And so quite a lot of people revert to calling them B names, but B might be just the letter B, you know. So, so I, I tried to use something that was probably slightly closer to how the old Norse pronunciation would have been, but also makes it distinctive enough <laughs> just, just to, to understand what, what I'm referring to. And uh, we understand that you're now researching a bit closer to Thornton in the street. So could you tell us something about your, <laughs> your findings there? Um, well, I, I, the short answer is not really yet, but uh, what I'm doing, it, it, there, there, there is quite a lot of involvement of the community of St Cuthbert. I mean, I, I, I talked about new settlements not being, not being found very often north of the Tees, but of course the community of St Cuthbert is quite often found south of the Tees. Uh, and of course, after the Norman Conquest, they took over North Allerton as a separate shire or liberty. Uh, and uh, Craig itself became part of County Durham because of their, their influence there. So uh, at the moment, I'm looking at uh, the written sources relating to the community of St Cuthbert, which, which are 
mainly survived from the in their present form from the uh, late uh, 11th and, and 12th, early 12th centuries, uh, to see what they have to say uh, about the activities of the community. I, I, I think that will be quite significant in, in quite a lot of the things that I'm looking at. But also, um, I'm looking at the, uh, the kind of administrative structure of the areas. I mean, I suppose most of what I've talked about this evening has been about administrative structures, local, local communities, local government, in a way. And uh, I, I think that what I'm interested in finding out is whether the pattern of Bu townships is related to old royal estates, such as North Allerton, large, large royal estates, whether uh, or Pickering for that matter. Uh, whether these were required to find some space for uh, Scandinavian communities uh, and also on the model of what I think is the uh, the involvement of the Archbishops of York in, in providing land for uh, for settlers whether that also applies in in areas like the Vale of Mowbray so I need to try to research lots of things, royal estates, uh, early ecclesiastical estates, um, as well as looking just at the topography of the area and, and, and trying to work out why people settled in which place. Right, will you be using the archives at the University of Durham? Um, I, 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 I'm not thinking about that at the moment. I'm using the uh, the the, the the earliest the earliest records the history of St Cuthbert uh, the 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 the, 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 uh, the the record called the Libellus de Exordio uh, and another one called the Historia Regnum they they they're all uh, available in print and have been edited to modern standards so uh, or most of them so I shall be using those first and. The way, the way I do it is, is sources work through Victoria County history. A colleague of mine, Steve Alderson, provides quite a lot of the detailed information, and then we go around uh, to have a look at the these places in the landscape um, because uh, I, I think it's it's quite dangerous to try to come to some conclusions without actually going to look at these places. So when we're allowed to go out and uh, drive around the area, then that'll be uh, that'll be part of it. And of course, the uh, we can go up to uh, Kirby Sixton, which is where the Chancellor of the Exchequer lives. <laughs> well, that's brilliant. Thank you for answering so many questions. Okay, uh, um, Stuart, and I'll now hold, hand you back to Bill. Okay. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Well, we got there in the end, so that's a great relief and a great pleasure for us all. Um, the number of questions we've had tonight is testament to how interested people were, but thank you for your presentation. Really, really informative. Um, I'm certain we'll get you back up to Thornton Street uh, when we're able to. Uh, we're not that far from Kirby Sixton. Uh, oddly enough, we did used to know the people that live in Kirby Sixton Hall where uh, Mr Sunak presently lives. Um, I hope everybody else enjoyed tonight's presentation. Um, I'm certain you did and I'm really pleased that you've hung on until the end. Uh, feedback as always is really appreciated so please don't hold back, Let, let's have it. Um, I've also got to move on and thank the Lottery Heritage Fund because they're the ones who've supported us and allowed us to provide this and the other webinars that we're putting on free of charge. Um, I'm going to promote our book again. You might be a little bit fed of us seeing this, but we still have copies of it. Uh, £5 if you collect it, I want it delivered locally. £6.50, post and package included. And again, I'll mention about Chris Gerrard's book. This really is a good read, um, particularly if you have any Scottish ancestry. Um, this is a, a weightier volume, so the book itself is £15, but postage and packing is £3.20. Okay, right, moving on. Um, our next webinar uh, is Thursday, 4th of March. We have Al Oswald, um, again a good friend of us and knows 
Fulton Street well. Al's from the University of York and he's going to be talking to us about what can the discoveries made at Warren Percy teach us about medieval Thornley Street? So we've focused on Thornley Street and that will be really good news for us. Okay, uh, that's it for tonight. Um, as I said, we've got there um, and it's been a good night and we've had lots and lots of questions. So thank you very much for those. Um, until we get to the 4th of March, uh, please keep safe and well and we'll see you soon. Good night.